Uh, we are in the middle of a uh, never-ending series titled Encounters with Jesus. And so we are nearing the end today is the penultimate message in this series. Next week will be our last message in the Encounters with Jesus series. But each week we've been looking at a real encounter that a real person has had with the real Jesus. And so we've looked at a, a lot of different encounters in the Gospels, and today we actually turn the page to the book of Acts. So we're, we're no longer in the Gospels, we're in the book of Acts, and uh, where, we, where we just read Acts chapter 1 is our encounter for today. So for the last few weeks, we've been looking at encounters that the disciples had with the resurrected Jesus. So we talked about Doubting Thomas, how uh, he encountered Jesus a week after the rest of the disciples did uh, on, on Resurrection Sunday. He had to wait a whole nother week to encounter Jesus. Jesus for himself, and, and then we talked about Jesus restoring Peter, and then last week we talked about uh, the, um, the Great Commission and Jesus encountering his disciples on the mountain in Galilee, and many people mistakenly believe that that was Jesus' final words to his disciples, that the last thing he said was, go and make disciples of all nations, and, and uh, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and I will be with you always to the very end of the age. It was one of the last things that Jesus said to his disciples but it's not the last thing he said. And so today we're going to look at the encounter that the disciples had with Jesus right before he went up to heaven as he ascended. This is the last time, these are the last words that, that Jesus spoke to them while he was still with them in the flesh. So again, if you have your Bibles, open them up to Acts chapter 1. We're going to walk through slowly the passage that we, we just uh, read. And, and just to give you a little context, um, the book of Acts was written uh, by Luke. He also wrote the book of Luke, or the gospel of Luke. And it's kind of a, a two-part series. And, and honestly, in the early church, the early church tradition was that these books were, were read together, not even really two separate things. And so in our modern Bibles, they're kind of separated out. But, but he kind of meant for them to go one right after the, uh, the next to, to connect with one another. And so uh, we're going to pick it up here uh, where he, he left off. So he, he finishes um, the Gospel of Luke with a brief, very abbreviated description of Jesus' ascension. And then in the book of Acts, he gives us a, a more extended version of that, that encounter that the disciples had. So uh, you can read along with me Acts chapter 1, starting at verses 1 and 2. He says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. So he's referencing the Gospel of Luke. Until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. So let me pause right there. We get some important information here, some important context for our, our study today. Um, the first is just some context about Luke. So here's what you need to know about him. Luke was a physician. He was a doctor. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 14, it tells us that. So Luke was a very intelligent man. He's a lot smarter than I am. He's a very smart, intelligent, uh, well-educated individual. And he was also um, uh, very um, interested in who Jesus was. And so he, he was um, very thorough in his investigation of who Jesus was. So Luke was a physician. He was also a Gentile. He was not Jewish. Luke is not a Jewish name. So he was a Gentile. Uh, he was not one of the 12 disciples. So a lot of times people think that Luke must have been one of the disciples, uh, one of the apostles, because he wrote the Gospel of Luke. He was not one of the 12 disciples. He was a contemporary of the 12 disciples, and, and he was a friend of theirs and actually went on to be a companion of theirs in, in ministry work. And, and you'll learn about that and read about that if you read through uh, the book of Acts. But he was actually not an eyewitness to Jesus' life and miracles, uh, his death, his resurrection here on earth. And so he had to go and do a very thorough investigation to document what we have now as the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And so, um, so Luke here, he's documenting what he's learned. But again, I just want to remind you, he, he's a very intelligent individual, very smart guy here who went and documented all this. And then he was also a, a co-laborer, a ministry partner, a friend, and a companion of the Apostle Paul, which we'll get to in the, in the, the coming days here. But, but for now, that's what you need to know about Luke. And then also, you see that he's addressing this man named Theophilus. He's telling him, hey, I wrote to you before, and if you open up the Gospel of Luke and you read the, the introduction, you will see that he's, he's addressing the same person. And actually, in the Gospel of Luke, he, he calls him most excellent Theophilus. 
And so he writes both of these books to this man, primarily to this man named Theophilus. Now, Luke also understood that he was writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here. And so he knew that this would have greater reach and greater impact than just this one person. But here's what we know about Theophilus. Um, Basically nothing. Okay, that's what we know about him. We don't know a whole lot about him. Uh, But here's what we can speculate. We can speculate that he was possibly a high-ranking Roman official, And so that's why Luke addresses him in his Gospel of Luke as the most excellent Theophilus. Um, So there's a chance that he was a high-ranking Roman official who was just curious about Jesus and wanted to know more. It's possible that he was a converted Roman official. And so now he he was tasking Luke with this responsibility. Like, I I need to know everything. I need to know all the details about who Jesus is. I've had my own personal encounter with him, but, but I need to know more. So that's possible. It's also possible that he was actually a a gospel patron, which is essentially somebody who, yes, they believed in Jesus and they were wealthy, they were well off, they were a person of importance, a person of significance. And so they actually commissioned Luke and, and you'll see in the book of Acts, Luke and Paul, they go on these missionary journeys together. So it's possible that he was the one commissioning Luke to go on these missionary journeys and paying for it and simply saying, I need you to document while you're on these journeys, the life of Jesus and, and all of the good things that God has done through the church. Again, we don't really know for sure, but here's why all of that matters. This was written by a real person to a real person. We're talking about human history here. And so sometimes when it comes to the Bible, we can have this this false concept of the Bible that it's just this magical book that fell out of heaven and just landed in our laps. That's not what it is. It is a, a, yes, absolutely inspired by the Holy Spirit living word, but it was written by real people. That, that existed in real human history. So this man was a really intelligent human being, a physician, a doctor, who was also, he kind of functioned like an investigative journalist, very, very detailed, very thorough. If you ever read the Gospel of Luke, you'll notice that all the way through, and he's recording all of this information that he learned about who Jesus is. And so, so that's how he opens up the book of Acts. And then go back to, to verse three with me now. After his suffering talking about Jesus, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Let me pause there. There is a lot to unpack in that text. And for some of y'all, you just got really excited. Like, we're, we're just curious, like, where are, my, where are my Pentecostal charismatic people at in the house? Where are you at? So you don't even have to look for them. Just listen. Just listen. They always, they're always just making noise. That's what they do. Just listen for them. You don't even have to look. So if, you're, if you come from that background, you just got excited because we're talking about the Holy Spirit, we're talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And if you came from the more like um, liturgical backgrounds, maybe you were raised Methodist or, or, or uh, Lutheran or maybe even just Baptist, you're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> we got a Pentecostal who thinks he's Baptist. That's great. <laughs> oh, man, I love it. They'll shut you down in the Baptist church for that real quick. They'll just sit down, shut up, don't open your mouth. No, I'm just kidding. We love them all. We love them all. But depending on your background, you maybe got a little uncomfortable right here. But before we get to that, a few things. First of all, Jesus appeared to his disciples many times, many times after his resurrection. Gave them many convincing proofs. Not just once, not just twice, not three times. Many, many times he appeared to them over a period of 40 days. We're talking about almost seven weeks that he walked the earth. So so again, this is important that you understand the timeline here. Jesus didn't die on the cross, resurrect from the grave, and then shoot right up to heaven. He stuck around for seven weeks. I mean, it hasn't even been seven weeks since Easter Sunday. Think about how much has happened since Easter Sunday in your life. And Jesus was around for that whole period of time and continued to show up in their lives, continued to to give them many convincing proofs. He he sat with them. He ate with them. He talked to them. And he wasn't some sort of ghostly figure. He was sitting there saying like, hey, you got a piece of chicken? Anybody got some food for me? Like, I'm hungry. He sat there and ate. He He was spending time with them, giving them many convincing proofs that he was alive. And he talked to them about the kingdom of God. 
And then the text says, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. And on this occasion, as we'll soon discover, it was the last time that he was with them. While he was eating, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. Do not leave Jerusalem. So again, the Great Commission, when he's with the disciples, he tells them, Go and make disciples of all nations. All authority has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And yes, I will be with you always to the end of the age. But that wasn't the last thing Jesus said. The last thing Jesus said was actually, you need to sit and wait for a little while. Yes, I'm going to send you out. I've got work for you to do. You're going to go and make disciples, but don't go just yet. Actually, sit, stay right here in Jerusalem. Don't go anywhere. Wait Because I I have a a gift for you that my father has promised that I've talked to you about. If you remember the the last conversation Jesus had with his disciples before he went to the cross at the Last Supper. In John, you you can read chapters 14, 15, 16. Jesus repeatedly talks about how he's going to send them the Holy Spirit. That he's going to leave and that he's going to send them the Holy Spirit. This is the third person of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. So let me also just clarify real quickly in case you've got this mistaken. It's, the Holy Spirit is not an it. It's a he. It's a person. We're talking about he, the Holy Spirit. That Jesus says, I'm going to send him to you. He will come and and dwell with you and live in you and lead you and guide you and teach you and correct you and remind you of everything I have told you and he will empower you. And he tells his disciples, it's actually better that I leave. It's better for you that I go so that the Holy Spirit can come. Think about how radical of a statement that is. Think about how many times in your life you have thought, man, I just, I, I so wish Jesus could just be right here with me. And Jesus is going, are you kidding me? It's better for you. You have it better than the disciples. It's better for you that I left so that I could send you the Holy Spirit. And so he's prepping them here. He's saying, saying, listen, don't go anywhere yet. Sit and wait because I'm going to send you the gift that my father has promised, the Holy Spirit. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Two things real quick. John baptized with water and we baptize with water. Next Sunday, we will be baptizing about, we have already about 30 individuals signed up for baptism. Praise God. We're obedient to the commands of Jesus. We baptize individuals in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We'll be doing that here next Sunday morning, right here on stage. It's going to be an incredible time. And, and so I just want to say something to those of you who have, who have given your lives to Christ. You've received this free gift of salvation. If you have not been baptized, that is your next step. That is your next step, is to be baptized in water. Every single one of us have been called to be baptized. And so, so let me be clear. Baptism doesn't save you. Jesus saves you. Baptism doesn't save anybody. Jesus saves us. We talked about this with the encounter of the thief on the cross. He wasn't baptized, and yet he got to go to heaven. And so baptism doesn't save us. But I would also push back against anyone who says, I don't need to be baptized. Baptism doesn't save me. And I would say, well, I, I'm not sure you can call yourself a Christian if you're not willing to be obedient to what Jesus told you to do. I, I just always struggle. Like if somebody's like, I'm not going to get baptized. And I'm like, well, then you're not, you're not, not going to obey anything else Jesus said to do. Baptism is pretty easy compared to some of the things Jesus is going to call you to do. Yeah. Baptism is pretty easy. He's calling you to a life of obedience. Baptism is simply the, the public declaration of the inner work that Christ has already done in your life. It's letting the world know that Jesus has raised you from death to life. That's all it is. And so your next step next Sunday is baptism. Right after the service, there is a class in room 100 right across the hall. Where, where you can go and learn all about it, and sign up and get connected, and take your next steps and get baptized next Sunday morning. I, man, I, I, will, I will preach like a three-minute sermon if I need to to baptize 300 people next Sunday. Yeah. Whatever it takes. Y'all, y'all got a little too excited about that. I'm not sure if you're excited about the 300 or the three-minute sermon. I'm not sure. Hopefully it was the 300 people. So Jesus says, John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So I'm not going to get into all the theological differences between what people believe when it comes to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I don't have time for it. Um, you You can study that on your own if you want to, but here's what I will tell you. It's in here, so I'm not going to avoid it either. 
I'm not going to avoid talking about what Jesus describes as this baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so I want to just make this as simple as I possibly can for you. When Jesus makes this statement, he, he connects them together. John baptizing with water and, and Jesus baptizing with the Holy Spirit because he's, he's trying to give us a visual. And the visual of baptism with water is complete immersion. So, so in the first century world, when people were baptized, baptized right there in the Jordan River, they were baptized in, all the way in the water. You go underneath the water, symbolizing death to yourself. You come up out of the water, symbolizing new life in Christ. And that, that's what baptism, again, depending on your background, there may be some people who, who are here and, and your upbringing, your background, if it was one of those more mainline experiences, Methodist, Lutheran, maybe even Catholic, you were baptized as a baby or uh, you've seen baptisms generally, it's just this little bit of sprinkling. I'm not here to, you know, debate people over the different modes of baptism. Actually, one of my favorite memories of city church uh, baptisms was we had a, a service out at McMillan Park about four or five years ago, and we, we brought a baptism tub with us, and we set it up, and people from the community came, people from the church came, and then we said, hey, if you, if you have not been baptized and you've given your life to Christ or you want to do that right now, give your life to Christ, come and get baptized, you can. And we had people right then and there make a decision, follow Jesus, come forward, want to get baptized. And there was this one woman who came forward. We, we heard her story. She gave her life to Christ. She just wanted to take that next step of obedience. We said yes. She came over to me. She stepped in the tub. She put one leg in the tub just like this. And then she stopped and she said, uh-oh. And I said, what? And she she pointed down to her other leg, and she said, I totally forgot, I'm on house arrest. <laughs> and I'm like, God, you always want to give me the interesting scenarios, don't you? Try to test me right here, right now. What are we going to do? I started processing in real time. Just put yourself in my shoes for a minute. In real time process, like, what are we gonna, I'm like thinking, like, do I ask somebody to come and hold her leg up so we could just dip the rest of her body? And I'm not really sure. That feels weird. So finally, I just said, hey, somebody give me a, give me a bucket or something. Somebody brought me a bucket or a pitcher of water, pitcher of water and they came over, and, and I just poured it right over her head. And she was baptized right then and there. And let me just say, like, that, her baptism is no less significant than anybody else's. So we're not interested in debating the modes of baptism. She was baptized. But the visual that Jesus is trying to give here in this moment is this idea that you were baptized in water in full immersion. Every fiber of your being covered. And he says, and I'm going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit. You're going to be fully immersed with the Holy Spirit. Covered from head to toe. Every fiber of your being when I send you the Holy Spirit. He is going to have complete control. You will need to be totally surrendered. Because he, he, he is going to immerse you with himself. And, and so we see that play out in Acts chapter 2. I wish I had time to, to unpack the whole passage for you today. But in Acts chapter 2, I'll just tell you briefly what happens. They're all gathered. They're waiting, doing what Jesus said to do. They're anticipating. They're waiting. They're praying. And then the Holy Spirit comes like a mighty rushing wind. And it fills the room. And supernatural things start happening. Unbelievable, incredible, supernatural things start happening. Just a mighty move of the Holy Spirit in that place. And, and things that, that, that would, again, if you're, if you're a, a Lutheran, a Methodist, or, or a Baptist, this is going to make you real uncomfortable. But man, God starts moving in that place. And all of a sudden, all these people from all over the world, different, different Jews who have come from different regions and even speak different languages, they all start talking to one another and they can understand one another. They can hear what they're saying. They start speaking in these tongues and it's incredible. It's this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then there are always, anytime you see a mighty move of God, there's always gonna be outside people who wanna criticize. And that's exactly what happened there. There were outsiders who came, they, they saw it, they said, it looks like you guys are drunk. And at City Church, that's a possibility. We've had it, man. Like, if, like I'm, I, there's sometimes somebody's up front worshiping, and I'm like, bro, I don't know if they're feeling the spirit or feeling what they drank before they came to church today, but either way, we're glad they're here. But in this situation, they weren't drunk. The Holy Spirit was just m moving in a mighty way. And, and then Peter stands up in front of the multitudes while they're receiving that outside criticism. And again, I just, just want to remind you, it will happen. Like when God moves, there will be criticism. 
There will be people who don't understand it. You know, I, I don't know if you know this, but, but last week, man, again, we, we had an incredible Sunday. We packed out the place, both services, and it drew lots of attention. The news showed up, and, and then it made the local news. And, uh, and then I, I saw, you know, it was getting shared on social media a lot. And one of the things I like to do to entertain myself is read comments on Facebook from the local news. <laughs> if you're ever bored, bro, I'll tell you what, just go read the local news comments on Facebook. And so uh, there are always going to be people who don't understand this. So there's one person who's, you know, a little critical. And they, they said, in, in a response to that, because that, uh, they had a picture of this room just full of people. Somebody commented and said in response to that, does Fort Wayne really need another church? And somebody who worked for the news actually responded, and they said, well, from the looks of this picture, I think so. <laughs> I said, man, that's good. That's good. I think so. Maybe we need more churches. I mean, uh, y'all keep showing up. We made more room, and now we're out of room again. I don't know what to do about that, but we're going to have to plant a church here soon. I don't know, something. But Peter, he's experiencing that same kind of criticism. People just don't understand it. So Peter stands up in front of this crowd of people, many of whom were the ones who were yelling, crucify him, when Jesus was, was pre being prepared to hang on the cross. And Peter stands up to that same crowd of people, and he preaches the gospel. And, and at one point he says, the same Jesus that you crucified, that you crucified, God has raised from the dead. Now listen, this is the same Peter who just a few weeks prior was denying he even knew Jesus to a servant girl. To a servant girl, he was denying he even knew Jesus. And fast forward, and now he's standing in front of a multitude of people, people with all sorts of influence and power and authority, many who probably could have had Peter killed that day. And Peter is standing up and preaching boldly the good news of the gospel of Jesus. And at the end of his sermon, 3,000 people are saved that day and baptized in that same day. That is a mighty move of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're talking about here. When Jesus says, you, are going to, you need to wait don't go anywhere, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus is preparing them for. Verse six. So Jesus finishes saying that, and then verse six, they gathered, then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus is going, are you serious? Like, did you not hear what I just said? Like all along, these disciples have been waiting for Jesus to come and establish some sort of earthly kingdom to overthrow the Roman Empire and reestablish this, this kingdom of Israel where they had earthly rule and reign. And now Jesus is trying to prepare them. He's saying, I'm getting ready to leave. I'm getting ready to go to the Father. You sit here and wait because I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit and you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and, and incredible things are going to happen. And their response is, but wait, Jesus, but, but is now the time? Are you, are you going to, that's cool and all, but now, right, is when you're going to start your kingdom? I'm so thankful for the witness and the testimony of the disciples it gives me so much hope because I am just as much of a fool as these brothers are. And I continually don't get it and God is so patient with me. Verse seven, he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the father has, sent, has set by his own authority. It is not for you to know. So in, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, Jesus actually says, no one but the father knows. No one but the father. Not the angels in heaven not the son of God himself. And yet some of y'all keep listening to some YouTube prophet who's telling you that he knows when Jesus is coming back. And I'm telling you like, get rid of that garbage. That's nonsense. We have a term for that. It's called a false prophet. Anytime somebody tells you, tells you they know exactly when Jesus is coming back, you just look at them and say, no, you're wrong. And I can tell you why. I'll show you in the scriptures, you are a false prophet. Stop listening to that nonsense. 
And stop sharing it with other people. You don't know. I don't know. Jesus himself doesn't know. Only the Father knows. And so Jesus says, no, it's not for you to know. Stop worrying about that. It's not for you to know. Instead, I've got work for you to do. Watch this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So instead of focusing on me coming back and establishing my kingdom right now, he says, I've got work for you to do. You will receive power. When, when the Holy Spirit falls, you will receive power. And, and you will become my witnesses. You will receive power. Listen to me. You cannot even be a Christian apart from the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. It is impossible for you to be a, a follower of Jesus apart from the Holy Spirit. So I get it, depending on your experience, depending on your background. Like I, I was raised in the Pentecostal charismatic church. I, I saw a lot of great stuff that came out of that and I saw a lot of unhealthy stuff that came out of that. And, and, and I just want you to know, like we're, we're not a Pentecostal charismatic church. I, I'm not trying to make us that, but, but I, I do want us to be a biblical church. I do want us to be a biblical church. So I'm, I'm not interested in being a Baptist church or a Methodist church or, or a Lutheran church. Again, nothing, nothing wrong with any of those churches. I just, I'm just trying to be faithful to the text. I just want to be a, a biblical church. And what we see clearly in the word of God is that you cannot be a follower of Christ apart from the Holy Spirit. You cannot do this Christian life apart from the Holy Spirit. You can't even receive salvation apart from the Holy Spirit. That is the work of regeneration. The Holy Spirit is the one that, that wakes you up to your need for God. You did not do that for yourself. You were dead in your sins and transgressions. That means it required somebody else to bring you back to life. That is the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And then from there, when he wakes you up and he makes you aware and then he leads you to salvation, from that moment forward, he wants to fill you and indwell you to empower you to live a Christian life, to live a godly life, to live a life following Jesus. You can't do this on your own. And so if you find yourself sitting here in this room today and you feel frustrated because you feel like you just you can't quite figure it out, feel like you're striving and you're getting nowhere. You feel like you keep failing over and over again with the same stuff over and over again. I'm, I'm here to tell you, maybe you need to surrender your life to the, the work of the Holy Spirit. Stop trying to do this on your own and let the Holy Spirit empower you. Remember, Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, didn't have enough courage to own up to the fact that he even knew Jesus to a servant girl apart from the indwelling, empowering, filling of the Holy Spirit. And then after he received this gift from God, he boldly proclaimed the gospel to the same people who crucified Jesus. And not only did he boldly proclaim it, but people came to saving faith in Christ. And so again, I just, just want to challenge us and encourage us. You cannot live a Christian life apart from the Holy Spirit. And so we need to be surrendered to him daily. We need to allow him to be at work in our hearts and in our lives. We need to be listening to his voice, following his lead, submitting ourselves to him. And ultimately, we, we just, all of us, we need a fresh anointing work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Every single one of us. And we need that daily. We need that daily. Now, now watch this. Again, I, I believe in the work of the Spirit. I, I believe in the supernatural sign gifts of the Spirit. So I, I, believe on, I believe in prophecy. I believe in words of knowledge. I've seen it. I've experienced it. I believe in visions and dreams. I believe in tongues and interpretation. I, I believe in all of that. But listen to me. Those aren't the point. The, the purpose of the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit is that we would bear witness to Jesus. Not that we would demonstrate some sort of power that, that makes us look good or that makes us look special. Like, like if, if this demonstration of power in your life is drawing people to you but not Jesus, it, it's probably a spirit, but it's not the Holy Spirit. The, the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit continually draws people to Jesus and, and, it, and it teaches us to live out the call on our lives that we would decrease so that he could increase. 
And so, yes, I, I believe in all of it. But also, I just, I just want to say this. Sometimes we can separate out and try to parcel out sign gifts as if those are supernatural and that, that other gifts of the Spirit somehow are not. All of it is supernatural. Every gift of the Spirit is supernatural. So if you have this, the gift of serving, the spiritual gift of serving, that is a supernatural gift. And, and God will use that gift to draw people to him. So I just want to share one example uh, of someone who I, I believe pr probably has the gift of serving. And th this individual, uh, they didn't even know I was going to share this story today because they would have told me not to. They, they don't, they don't, they're so humble, they probably wouldn't want me to tell this story. But it's too late. I already told the 9 o'clock, so I'm telling the 11 o'clock too. <laughs> so last Sunday, we had our, our grand opening, incredible day, and during the 9 o'clock service, this jumbotron behind me kind of flickered a few times, I guess. And so our, our production director, his name is Ben Westfall, he, he saw that and, and he thought, that's, that's not okay. Like he, he thought, I, I don't want anything to be a distraction. And so Ben, with his servant's heart, thought, I've got to fix that problem. And so between the 9 and 11 o'clock service, he went and, and traced it and found out that there was a, a cable that was maybe bad somewhere. And the simple solution would be to just kind of re-terminate that cable. I think it's, uh, this is all above my pay grade. Okay, so I'm explaining things that I don't understand at this point. So just <laughs> stick with me. But the simple solution would just be to fix it kind of right behind the wall. That would have made it a 99% likely fix. But for, for Ben, 99% wasn't good enough. Because he's serving God and he's serving you all. And so instead, between those services... He went down underneath of where we are right now is a, is a basement. But don't think like nice, new, fancy basement. Think like creepy, scary basement that you don't want to go down to. And in that basement are big, long hallways. And then offshoots of those hallways are really creepy, dirty, dusty tunnels. Three foot by three foot wide tunnels. And there is a tunnel that's three foot by three foot that runs from behind this screen all the way back to the back of this production area. And the 100% fix would be to run a new cable and crawl through that tunnel 75 feet and reestablish this new cable so that the church would be served and God would be glorified. And Ben chose to do that with a heart of service. And he didn't want anybody to talk about it. And so I feel obligated to talk about it. But could you just help me thank Ben, first of all. And here's why I think that Ben probably has the gift of service and I do not. I'm not crawling through that tunnel. There ain't no way. There ain't no way I'm crawling in that tunnel. No way. So if that's, I don't know, maybe that's how you determine who's got the gift of service. We're going to start sending people through tunnels here, but it's all supernatural. It's all supernatural. But that's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, again, let me just give a couple of warnings. I, I believe in the work of the Holy Spirit, but it must be biblical. So that, that is your filter. That is your filter. We're, we are called to test everything. If somebody gives you a word, test it, and test it with Scripture. Does it line up? Does it match according to the Word of God? And if not, then, then simply reject it. doesn't mean you reject those people, but reject that word. But we want to we be careful. We want to be cautious, and ultimately, Everything that we do, when, when, when you're trying to test, like is, is, this, is this move of God that I'm witnessing, if, if this is truly a work of the Holy Spirit, it always points us back to Jesus. The Holy Spirit, he always points us back to Jesus. Jesus is always the one being glorified. So it must be Christ-centered. And, and it must be evangelistic in nature. It should be drawing people to Jesus. It should be drawing people who don't know Jesus to Jesus. If it's repelling them from Jesus, then there's a good chance it's not a work of the Holy Spirit. And these are the last words. Watch this. Verse 8, one more time. These are the last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples before he ascended into heaven. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And that's my desire for this body, is that, that we would live a Spirit-empowered life that you would receive power, that you, you would not walk through this life just checking off a bunch of boxes, trying to be good moral people. 
No, that, that, that you would be empowered by the filling and dwelling supernatural work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And that out of that would be this outflow that wherever you are, you are bearing witness to Jesus. That you are bearing witness to Jesus in a way that is drawing people unto him. He says, you will be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, that's right where you are. In all of Judea, that's the region near where they were. In Samaria, that's where they didn't want to go and to the ends of the earth. And that's exactly what we're called to do as well, to be his witnesses right here in this community, to to be witnesses in our region, to be witnesses in the places that you don't want to go to. He's probably gonna call you specifically there, so prepare yourself for that. Again, this is what it means to live a life of obedience. It means I'm not Lord, Jesus is Lord. So wherever he calls me to go, I'm going to go. Whatever he tells me to do, I'm going to do it to bear witness to his name and then ultimately to the ends of the earth. Those are the last words that Jesus spoke to his disciples. Verse 9, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going when suddenly two men dressed in white these are angels, stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. He's coming back. Jesus is coming back. We don't know the time, we don't know the date, but we do know this, he is coming back. Physically, visibly, bodily, he is coming back to establish his eternal kingdom here. New heaven, new earth, here. He is coming back. And in the meantime, I love what these angels say. Men of Galilee, what are you doing? Like, why, why are you standing there staring up at the sky? Like, don't, don't you get it? You have work to do. Yes, he's gone, but he's coming back. You have work to do. So stop standing there just staring up into the sky. Maybe some of you are familiar with this phrase. My grandmother used to, to always say, some people can be so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. Have you ever heard that before? Like sometimes as, as Christians, we can, we can kind of live like, we can insulate ourselves, get in this little bubble where all we want to do is just spend all of our time with other Christians just waiting for Jesus to come back. And these angels are like, are, what, are you, what are y'all doing? There's a, there's a lost world out there. You need to go prepare yourselves for the Holy Spirit to come and fill you so that then you can go and make disciples of all nations. There is work to do. And listen to me, there is still work to do. I'm talking to you all now. There is still work for each and every one of us to do. So yes, we long for and wait and anticipate Jesus' return. But in the meantime, you and I, we have been given the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is dwelling within us, living within us, to, to give us power to be his witnesses wherever we go. This is what we've, we've been called to do. And so listen, I, I just have such a burden for, for our community right now, for the lost in our community. Such a burden. And, and actually, just the last couple of nights, God's just been doing something powerful. The Holy Spirit's just been working in my heart. So for the last couple of nights, um, my, my wife has been out of town. She's on a pastor's wife's retreat, um, which... All it is is just an excuse for them to get away from their husbands for a couple days because they need it because they're married to pastors. And so that's where she is. She'll be back this afternoon. But whenever she's gone, I just, I never sleep well, never sleep well. So for the last couple nights, just haven't slept well at all. And as I've been tossing and turning and, and wide awake in the middle of the night, the Holy Spirit has just continued to impress upon me that there is a community right here in the city of Fort Wayne, all around us, who are lost and they're spiritually starving. Listen to me, our world has lost its mind. It has lost its mind. Our our world is is so far from God in every way, every way imaginable, that, that outside of those who have the Holy Spirit, it's barren, it's dry. The land is parched. Our world is, is completely dried up and people are spiritually starving. And that's the image that, that the Holy Spirit just kept bringing to my mind is just people who are spiritually starving, desperate, and they don't even know what they're desperate for. They don't know what they're looking for, but they know that it's not available anywhere out there. And you and I have the bread of life. 
you and I have the living water. You and I have been given the Holy Spirit. But we need to be filled by him, completely immersed in him, in order to be his witnesses and and to testify about who Jesus really is, that, that he is what everybody out there is looking for, that he is what they're desperate for, that he is who they need. This is, this is why it's so important for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's not just so that, that we can see signs and wonders. It's not just so that we can feel good about ourselves. It's so that we can be sent out on mission to reach the least and the lost. This is the call for each and every believer, not just pastors, not just worship leaders, not just people who work in the church. If you are a follower of Jesus, this is your call on your life. And so, so in order to do that, you can't do it in your own strength. And neither can I. We need a, a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit in our lives. A fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit in our lives in order to empower us to be his witnesses. And so here, here's how we're going to close today. Um, worship team is going to come out and lead us in one more song. And this song is all about Jesus. Because the purpose of the filling of the Holy Spirit is that we would bear witness to Jesus. That we would be able to proclaim who Jesus is. To proclaim Jesus in our homes. To proclaim Jesus in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces in our schools, in our community, to those who are hurt, to those who are sick, to those who are lost, to those who are hopeless, to those who are struggling, to those who are desperate. That, that's our call. And so while, while we sing this song, I just wanna encourage you as we sing about Jesus and proclaiming his name, I wanna encourage you to just ask the Holy Spirit for a fresh anointing to ask the Holy Spirit for a fresh indwelling, a fresh filling over your life, that you would be completely immersed, completely saturated by the Holy Spirit so that you would receive power. Not not by your own might, not by your own strength, but by the Spirit of the Lord, that you would receive power to be his witnesses wherever you are. And and, and then I, I just want you to, again, For me, visuals help. Think about the timing of where we are in our world and and just, again, how how lost it is and God creating an opportunity for us to make more room and and to have a place to, to minister to people. You know, for more than 50 years, this building was a grocery store and people would come here to get their food. For more than 50 years, people were physically fed through this place. And man, I I just have such a desire that for the next 50 years and, and, and far beyond, that people would come here to be spiritually fed, that people would come here to receive the bread of life, to receive the living water, that this would be a place where people are fed because they're lost and they're desperate and they're hungry and Jesus is the only hope. And so I, again, just if you would pray as you, as you sing, just pray for a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit, but also pray that God would use this place to be a place of life and a place of spiritual nourishment for those who need it the most. Would you stand with me? I'm gonna pray us, pray, pray us into this song. Heavenly Father, we, we again thank you for your word. We thank you for what you're doing in our midst. We thank you for this place. We thank you for this body. Jesus, we thank you that you are the living word. We thank you that that we have been fed here today. We thank you that you have done that by the power of your Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit, we just ask you now for a fresh anointing. Would you just fill this place? Would you you just flood this room with your spirit? Would Would you immerse us in your spirit today? We need you so that we can have power from on high to be your witnesses and to do what you have called us to do. Move in this place. Jesus, may you be glorified as we proclaim your name. We pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus.